Yeah, yeah, what's up, man? It's Ed Memphis, Pippin. And, uh, you know, you just dropped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastards. You did. Keep it Pippin. Swamp up. Corilla. Double digit winner. Never been a chicken. All right, today we got Ed Memphis jumping off the porch with us today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the most gorgeous of them all? Ed Memphis, Pippin. They had your girls tripping since the beginning. You already know what it is, baby. Okay. Oh, that's your boy. My boy came prepared. Yeah, what? You know, just a little, you know, that's how I get off every time I greet somebody of, of work. You know what I mean? You know so, what I mean? That's what we do. Rocking off like cut off stockings. You did. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on the porch with us today, gang. Man, it's a blessing to be here, bro. Square business. For yeah, sure. I, I mean it with every ounce of it. You know what I mean? For it's sure. a blessing to be here, bro. No Square rap. business. So, since the last time I saw you last year, what would you say you learned from that year, 2021? Man, um, I would definitely say uh, the importance of progress, even in time of, like, the only luxury we got in life is time, right? So, um, the emphasis of that, even more than anything, it just becomes more and more. So it's just um, all about making sure that I make every moment count. So I, I think the emphasis of that is the biggest thing that's, that's pressing me about from last year over to this year as far as just making sure that I stay on course and stay on, on standard of what I know I got to be doing. For sure. Yeah. So what lessons are you applying to this year that you learned last year? Uh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Shit, uh, I mean, excuse my language. Uh, I would definitely say patience, 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 more than anything. Uh, once you master patience, you know, that's something incredible. Uh, so patience and, 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 of course, the art of respect is always the foundation of me. So, you know, shout out to uh, Jay Prince for that. But, you know, definitely patience, man, the understanding of patience. Patience can save your life, and patience can also take your life to a whole nother level. So um, understanding patience, meaning not being complacent um, if there's a certain, you know, in that, in that perspective of patience, but um, definitely, if nothing else, understanding that everything is about timing. So that's what patience lies with. That's real. So what you out here working on in Atlanta? Oh, shoot, let me see. Hold on, let me take that one here. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like, let me, ooh, let me sit there right there. You did, you know what I mean? So, uh, I definitely, uh, oh, so while I'm in Atlanta, I'm working on, um, I'm actually putting together uh, a movie that we're going to get ready to start shooting. So I already done got the, the script right, I already working on it. So the, con the concept of the movie is, uh, you know, I always fucked out with karate growing up. It was just something I always took interest in. So I've been off and on with that all my life. So I'm just uh, putting together the concept of an artist that's just dealing with the day-to-day -day in the community. It's an everyday person that also took it to karate and had it, you know, almost like uh, if you ever seen The Last Dragon, kind of spin on it. So that's something we, uh, we're putting together actually right now as we speak as far as getting ready to start shooting and stuff this year. So I'm working on that. And then musically, of course, uh, we're going to run off about five projects this year far as you know your, your mixtapes or whatever you want to call them so um, the one that I got coming up next is called Harry Bush and Good Mead you know what I mean self-explanatory <laughs> Harry Bush and Good Mead so uh that's just that's just something that uh is more a soulful like given where I am right now in life from a more soulful perspective so it's still gonna have a Memphis bounce to it but it's gonna be on some player shit yeah you know what I mean square business that's real uh, uh, so for those who wouldn't know, how would you describe life in Memphis? <laughs> man, Memphis is uh it's 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 incredible, man. It's got its ups and its downs. The struggle of it makes you so much stronger because in Memphis ain't a lot of opportunity, right? And that's what's really contributing to what a lot of what's going on as far as what y'all see today with the crime and things. Memphis don't have um the development of the of the entertainment industry. Um, economically, a lot of things. So a lot of shit that you see down here um, in Atlanta, we don't have there. So as a result of it, you know, ain't, it ain't as many as options. So people thinking it's smaller, and not to necessarily say that in a bad way, but it's just reality. If there's not as much around you, then naturally you're not gonna, your mind's not gonna expand as much as it would somewhere where there are more things going on and shit happening. So as a result of it, bro, 
um, you get what you get today, which is a lot of violence and a lot of um, no understanding, bro. It's on site, you know what I mean? So people don't have nothing. They ain't working on a movie, per se, necessarily. So they just sitting in the hood, you know what I mean, or wherever we at, and, 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 and with no purpose or not as many opportunities, we got our mind on something else because the pressure of not having something uh, tends to push us either extreme good or extreme bad and so after so long, right? So a lot of people uh, forced in that situation to make their decision and then just the conditions of, the, of Memphis, bro, you, you get what you get today. But Memphis, what people don't understand, not to go too far with it, but Memphis is the center of the slave trade back in the day. So a lot of that spirit of murder and poverty and, and anger still exists throughout the city today. They, the, the same slaves that was then 200 years ago, shit, they bloodline still flow through the city today. So, you know, not to say uh, that's what's contributing to the, to, to the bad side, but the good and the bad of the city. So, you know, the, all that stuff still carries over to this day. You know what I mean? And then, of course, we, um, in Memphis, it's so outdated um, as far as politically, right? So, you know, you still got that old white folks, that old white money that's still running things in that city like, you know, like it is in many other towns. But, of course, with it being such a historically racist uh, city, uh, it's more prevalent there as far as opportunities. So, like, even with there with minorities, bro, minority contracting is like 1% down there. Like, the city is 65% black, but the minority contracts through the city are like 1%. So, shit, <laughs> that show you right there how much opportunity is being given to our people in the city. 65%, less than 1% on contractors, and this is a blue-collar city, so that means most of your employees are the people that are working-class people are working through contracts unless they got the opportunity to work through the government. So, you know, man, with that shit, man, it just makes a lot of good and the bad, bro. The square business, not to be too windy with it, but I just wanted to be detailed with it at the same time. Yeah. So, so how would you describe your childhood coming up in that city? Uh, well, my mom is, uh, my mom is, uh, my mom is uh, Jaton Wilson. So I got two legendary hustlers as parents. You know, just entrepreneurs, man. You know what I mean? They made it their way. They did a lot of what's being doing, done today. They was doing it in the 80s. So, uh, which is, you know, CPN hustles and whatnot. You know what I mean? Like, you know, my mom really was the first one that brought that, that aspect of that to the city of Memphis. She was the one who pioneered that. So, uh, you know, with it, I was fortunate enough to be around some of your biggest hustlers and, uh, black entrepreneurs uh, in a sense in the city. So I got, I got the game from a different perspective. So yeah, I grew up, uh, I was born in the streets, right? But at the same time, I saw the good and the bad. So a lot of folks that you see in the city, they mamas and dads ain't from the streets. They working class people. So they really didn't get to see how a lot of stuff supposed to be done when you in these situations to keep yourself out of the bullshit. But with me, fortunately, I was blessed to be in a situation where my, my daddy, you know, was he was the finessing king, robber, fake diamonds, everything. My pops, uh, not to you know rest his rest his soul, but just you know giving the aspect of him. Man, my pops was so cold. You know, he used to pull big time heights, so he ain't robbing nobody in the community like like that. He going to the white folks. You know what I'm saying? He casing jewelry stores, so he used to come dressed up in the jewelry stores like the UPS man, like Square Business or the police. He had that type of access. So you know uh, what he would do is he'll come in there in case the joint out, come back later and hit it, you know what I mean? And, and, and square business, he getting everything. So uh, the only, and in fact, he pulled this off for years. The only way he got caught was because he messed around and sold some diamonds to the wrong person. He ain't never get caught in the play of, 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 you know what I'm saying, of getting what he was getting. He got caught selling some diamonds to the wrong person that gave him up. So um, with that, my dad, um, the understanding of him, then allowed me to, um, um, that, that, that smarts and that plan and that tactical mentality. And then with my mom, I didn't really have as much of a relationship with my dad, though. But uh, he was around here and there when I was younger. So with the moms, you know what I'm saying, she, she did what she did. And as a result of that, I got to be around some of the biggest cats in the area. So a lot of your, uh, your legends in, the, in, the, in, in Memphis, you know, uh, shout out to Bo Pete, rest in peace, John Harris, uh, uh, Dale, Shauna, you know, all them cats that was just entrepreneurs that really had their own thing going back in the 90s. Uh, 
I was able to be around them and, and, and I got the game from them from a grander perspective. So when they taught me something, they taught me how to do it to get to the ultimate goal, which is being enterprise, more than just doing something to try to put a message out there, so to speak. You know what I mean? So that, that was part of that upcoming. And then as a, as a kid, you know, I came up in, in north of South Memphis, uh, Germantown, all of us. I grew up all over the city, but mostly I'm a North Memphis nigga by trade. So that's where I get my personality and my characteristics from, you know what I'm saying, being in the North. Then I moved out to Germantown about 14, and that's where I really took the game and the knowledge that I acquired living in the North, Frazier, Raleigh, uh, Watkins and Gal, you know what I'm saying? That's where I'm from, Alta Vista, where I came up as a kid. So I stayed over there with Overlook, Overlook Apartments. I, I stayed uh, right across the street from there in Peachtree Street. So all of that, you know what I'm saying? So I used to see Ronnie Woods uh, running the track back in the day at Ed Rice. You know what I'm saying? Y'all know who Ronnie Woods is. So I used to, you know, see him early in the morning running the track. I used to, you know, be around different cats that was big and had things going on and really used to give us the game. So uh, that's where I came up at, you know what I mean? Like I said, teenage years. I spent about four years out in Germantown, played football out there. Shout out to the G, you know what I mean? That's more a suburb-like area. But, you know what I mean, we was putting it down out there because I was taking what I was learning out in the north and bringing it to Germantown because they turned out, they don't know. Now, I, I wasn't even coming like that. I really was just coming out there as a teenager. But when, you know, one thing about instinct and nature, when we see demand, if you got a certain get up in you, man, you're going to supply demand. So when I came out there to Germantown, I saw there was a demand and then nobody, it was, it was a few cats with supply, but it wasn't as much to meet the market. So I came out there seeing what was going on and, and, and naturally, you know, if I can get a hold of something and you only, you know, I know I can get it for $25 and I can sell it to you for 100 125 one plus one equal two. So, you know, whether it was debt, uh, 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 you know, the playing man, I had man tournaments going, everything in the G, man. I had it turned up, man, you know what I'm saying? And uh, niggas used to call me Suge Knight going up, you know what I'm saying, the G. But I wasn't no bully, but, you know, niggas knew that, you know, it was square business. You know what I'm saying? It was square business. So, uh, you know, that was my upbringing from, from up to that point through teenage years. And then, you know, as a man, uh, Man, I've been an entrepreneur in the game, so I, I've been around for a while in Memphis. I used to host parties and events. I'm a marketing guru when it comes to marketing in the city as far as street marketing and things. So that's actually what I do now for a living. So, uh, you know, I've been moving around. Man. I've been moving around. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I've owned tax business. You know what I mean? I've done that as well. And uh, a lot of different little ventures, you know what I mean, come along the way that, that really got me to where we are today as artists. And, and, and not just as an artist, but also as an executive as well. Straight up. Yeah. So when would you say you jumped off the porch? <laughs> Man, that's a hell of a question. I say uh, making my first play, yeah, 98. 98, I was, I was 10. So I was 10 when I jumped out of the port for the first time. So the first time I jumped out of the port, it wasn't nothing but a small hustle play, but it, it really is what changed my life. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, man, I had got, I was always getting in trouble at school, so I got kicked out of school again. I was suspended. So I was like 10 years old doing contracting with my Uncle Paul. So he had us doing the jackhammer. So we was, and we was doing uh, different odd jobs at these rich white folk houses in Memphis. So one time we out there on Walnut Grove, man. I ain't gonna even say whose house it was. We was on Walnut Grove. And uh, I was in the yard raking some leaves. And uh, it was a big ass prescription bottle laying in the yard. So I picked it up and I seen it was some green and it was some weed. But I didn't understand the type of weed it was at the time. So I took the weed, showed my cousin. Long story short, my cousin wanted to try to flip it for what it would really work because he was a little older. And, um, you know, I, was, I wasn't trying to hear that shit. They wanted to play me, so I went behind him, grabbed my shit back, and went and sold it on the block. I ain't gonna lie, man. My, my uncle was, you know, I ain't gonna say who, but my, one of my uncles was my first customer, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and he finessed the shit out of me on there, so I ain't gonna lie, man. Bone my ass, bro. I think I got about $25, bro. So $150 bottle, man. <laughs> man, but you know what I'm saying? So my first. Play off the porch was a lesson. You did. My first play was a lesson, right? So yeah, yeah, that was the first 
uh, from the entrepreneurial aspect. That was when I jumped out the porch, man. Not real. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest life lesson you learned so far? Oh. Uh, consideration. Being thoughtful. Because that's everything. That right there, I know that sounds so broad, but that's that's why. That's that one if you can you if you can sum things up to one word, that's why. Consideration and just being thoughtful. Uh, because if in any situation in life, if you're considerate of the situation from every aspect of you being thoughtful of the process, that's gonna get you gonna be straight. And then you know with life, you know, they say stay one step ahead, but hell everybody one step ahead. So you really just on the same base with everybody else. And then it's a couple of folks two steps ahead. So the game with me was stay 10 steps ahead, you did. So if, and if you really considering every situation and being tactical and thoughtful, uh, which, you know, that comes with wisdom over time, you know what I'm saying? Uh, as long as you're doing that, then, you know, I think that that'll cover the roots of everything else in regards of what situation you're in. So whatever you're in, man, be considerate and thoughtful. Whether you done got caught in the jam, you're in the trenches, or if you're walking in the store, and you see somebody walking in the same time, instead of trying to blow them in, the, uh, trying to get in there first, man, hold the door for them, man. You'll be surprised with just having your heart in the right place will carry you to in life. So uh, that's another thing, too, I definitely want to say, having your heart in the right place, man. Square business. You know what I'm saying? I'm, bro, I've been in the streets all my life, bro. I was born in this, bro. And while, I, while I'm still here, bro, with a clean record, bro, I ain't snitched on nobody, and my record clean as a whistle, you did. But at the same time, the reason why, because I was always considering and thoughtful, and they go back to what I learned being around masters of the game in Memphis, teaching me, bro, if you're going to make this move, do it this way. I always consider this. They always pushing it down. My like, ass going straight to the penitentiary. Now you fuck up. You get caught with one gram of crack, you getting a thousand years. You know what I'm saying? That type of shit. So with that being said, I always moved a certain way, bro. Even when I was, bro, I was the man in Germantown. I'm a legend in the streets especially out in the G East Memphis, all of it. So, but the way I was able to do that, not to brag, was being thoughtful, bro, and having my heart in the right place. So I ain't always did the right thing, and then I made some moves that I ain't had no business making. But uh, at the same time, thank you, baby. I, um, I, I, was, I was, for the most part, I was able to learn from something. So if I did something to somebody that was wrong, bro, I done took niggas, you know what I'm saying? I done did my thing, but it was always somebody that was deserving of it. And they know, everybody know they was deserving of it. So that was a consistent thought. I just was the one that pulled it off. But it's, it, uh, in general, bro, my man, my heart is always in the right place to do right by people. Because one thing about me, I always know if my heart in the right place, I'm straight, bro. I ain't got to worry about nothing. I can sleep at night. As long as I know I made that move. And you can maneuver in the streets, bro. I'm a proof of it. You can maneuver in the streets with your heart in the right place. Now, that don't mean be soft, because it's a moment you got to be strong. But at the same time, as far as doing the right thing, niggas no common sense, bro. Do the right thing. You'll be surprised how much respect you gain in your community. Now, the two things about respect, people are going to either fear you or they're going to admire you, bro. And I prefer to be admired. Now, there's going to be some moments where you got to make niggas fear you. That, that happens. It's a mix of it. Ain't no one size fit all to nothing. But at the same time, I'm looking to make people admire me. So I make moves and I consider things before I do them to make people admire me, bro. That's my goal. I might not always meet that goal, but that is ultimately my goal. So, yeah, that's what I learned mostly anything in life, bro. And that's why I put the any nigga in the game, bro. That's free game, bro. Straight like that. Yeah, yeah, square business, square business. What is square business? Square business is the brand, bro, ultimately. That's the big picture. That's the label. That's what's gonna really create other stars, bro. Square business. And we coming to do square business, bro. I want to, uh, square business is transparency and being solid at the same time. That's what square business is. So with that being said, bro, I want to be as transparent as I can possibly be with people. I want to be rock solid as I can possibly be. I can look a man in his eyes and say that's square business. You understand what I'm saying? And you know that's what it is, bro, to the core of my soul, bro. Every ounce of me, you did. So that's what square business is, man. When I say something, I stand on it. Win, lose, draw, whatever. You know what I mean? That's what Square Business is. So ultimately, the brand with that, that's the concept of the brand. The brand is ultimately going to be just the enterprise of everything, bro, especially of all the entertainment. So for multimedia, security, music, everything, bro, that's the brand that we're creating right now. That's what I'm working on. So, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm really modern-day Master P when it comes to in the sense of the small spin. Not to sound corny with it, but, you know, to give you an idea of where we're going with it. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. So when would you say you started making music? 
2015, 2015, down in Houston. So after I had a play uh, that went south in Virginia, they ended up, <laughs> you know, they ended up uh, really putting me on the map nationally, man. To the point where I had congressmen watching me trying to make their next election off of our name, trying to make their next election off of me. Like they was literally trying to really like get elected off of trying to get us jammed up in, in what we had going on up in VA. So uh, we'll get to that, I guess. But, uh, you know, so with that being said, um, I had to get it. I came back to Memphis. Memphis was hot. The feds came in town. They were sweeping up everybody. So uh, I had to get out of Memphis. I, I, I wasn't trying to go down and I, I damn sure ain't trying to get caught up in nothing else unnecessarily if I can avoid it. So I knew. As much as my face was out in the camera, I knew in reality the business side of the paperwork, I wasn't nobody. I can get out of this. I can play this. So all I need to do is lay low and let them catch who all they want to catch. Just get the hell out of the way. You know what I'm saying? Do what y'all want to do. So I dipped to Houston. You know what I'm saying? Like Nah I said. You know what I'm saying? Catch a body here in Houston. Get low, nigga. So I got to Houston, got low. And when I got down there, uh, you know, the entertainment scene is real big down there too. So... I got to being around artists, making plays, you know what I'm saying, networking. And as a result, I used to be in the studio a lot. Got to, uh, I've always been a writer, you know what I'm saying. I, I got an IQ of 176. My IQ score is 176. So, um, and that's mostly in writing, is in creativity, because I'm left handed. So, with that being said, uh, when I got in the studio, I started writing with other artists, writing and, and producing for other artists, just straight out the bat. Uh, so then you know lead to me ultimately just saying look bro, ain't nobody else gonna project what I'm writing or what I'm doing uh, and what the vision I truly have in mind so I just said I'm gonna do it myself so that's what really made me jump out there that was around 2015 like I said that was down in Houston uh, I was running with some cats with uh, you know that was rap a lot affiliated so uh, everything was you know so I'm good on the up and up so uh, and shout out to them man shout out to them cats down there as well uh, I was really running with Wiki Cricket particularly uh, which was just kind of loosely, that's how I kind of got linked in with them. Rest in peace to Wiki Cricket. And Wiki Cricket was the one who really took me in. I, when I used to go, I started going to the open mics and showcases of that thing, you know what I'm saying? And um, I started coming up bubbling quick down there because I was really lyrical. So I was really applying my, my gift, which is creative writing and creative speaking. So I was really applying it to the process. And I was excelling with it, man, you know what I mean? I was really bubbling. So as a result of that, like, Wicked Cricket took liking to me, man. He loved me. So uh, Wicked Cricket took me around. He took me in. I ain't gonna even lie. I ain't really have shit at that time because I was trying to lay low. I couldn't do shit. I was working, bro. I worked temp service jobs. You hear me? Whatever. I remember, I, was, I remember one day I took a temp service job and I screwed up the toilet, bro. I never forget that the furniture store. And uh, I take pride in that today because I know that's what I had to do to get to where I had to get to, to hold it down, to stay out of where I need to stay up, and also what it made me, it taught me. I appreciated that most, so I still remember that. But uh, anyway, being in the H-Town, man, uh, running with Wiki Cricket, really, he took me in and really plugged me in the industry, introduced me to something, everybody. And from there, that's when I started really uh, jumping in the music business, so. That's yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah. So, what politician was trying to come up off my boy Ed Memphis name. Uh, what was his name? Congressman Bobby Scott, uh, something like that. Bobby Scott. I don't know his name for sure, but this had you can actually the videos and stuff is online. You know what I'm saying? I, I hate to put that, but <laughs> but it's the news clippings of that time. What was going on? It's online. They they, they were talking. They mentioned his name. They showed a picture of the, of the congressman that was that was trying to come up on it. And uh, I think that was Bobby Scott, some black congressman out there in Virginia. Uh, but if you go type in IRS police investigate more money taxes um, and click on the video with me and Enjoy man <laughs> at that time, man, uh, on my corporate swag then, uh, I, you can check and see the congressman, all the information, all is definitely in there though. You know, I sure. can't remember his name, it was Bobby something though. I don't, don't want to say Bobby Johnson, but I'm thinking <laughs> it what it was. It was yeah. something like that, man. Right? Some nigga that just said, I'm going to turn up on these niggas that he didn't even know, bro. We was really legit, bro. We was, like I said, we was doing taxes. Uh, it's more money taxes, right? Yeah. yeah ta walk us down, what's more money taxes? So walk us down, what is more money taxes? All right, so more money taxes is this, is this all right, so it's this franchise in Memphis, bro, that went viral. I don't know if y'all ever see the tax commercials. The ghetto white dude coming out in a helicopter rapping with the gold teeth. 
So all it back in the day, they went viral. They were doing this in the 90s. So these commercials, they would drop every tax season. This was unheard of. Nigga doing you tax preparation and you totally ghetto and you pushing being hood with it. That was totally different. So they went viral. So anyway, that created the more money taxes, little jank ass, little tax service. No disrespect to it, but I'm saying how just what, what you put me through at that time, being on the square with it. You know what I mean? Y'all know what's up with me. So, uh, you know, it, it, so basically they uh, was like this big time franchise in the local Mid-South area around Memphis. So to make a long story short, uh, one of my partners, shout out to Dre, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, Dre uh, went and secured franchise licenses for like seven franchises in, in Virginia, in Norfolk, Virginia. So uh, this is around 2012. So uh, we, uh, we all went up there. He knew I was more of the brain when it came to being tactical. So I got an ownership stake of my percentage, you know what I'm saying, just for, for applying my, my brain, you know what I'm saying, being that, and being the face because I knew how to, you know, had a conversation with the public. So uh, long story short, we was up there, Memphis cats, bro, we went up 20 deep, man. A bunch of us put our money together from the streets, you know what I'm saying, uh, and we, uh, we got a house, on Tidewater Drive, everybody in Virginia, I remember that, you know what I'm saying, big ass house in the hood, like eight bedrooms, it was in a freezing cold, no AC, no heat, I mean, no heat, you know what I'm saying, at some yeah. points the power went out, it's like zero degrees, literally, uh, right on the Atlantic Ocean. So anyway, we went up there, uh, 20 deep, 20 hood Memphis niggas, man, shout out to uh, at Ben, two live, shout out to Ben Ben, shout out to Danny, uh, 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 man, it's, it's plenty of my boys, man. I hate I'm missing names right now. My man, I'm, I'm drinking and smoking everything, so y'all gotta forgive me. But everybody know who that was on that trip. Shout out to Tristan. Uh, shout out to LP. You shout out to everybody, man, that was on that on that on that move at that time. So anyway, we went up there. So of course, going up there, 20 Memphis niggas. We we fly niggas. We the hustlers. We like the all star hustling team. I hate to sound cliche and corny, but that's really what it was. When Dre, Dre was the one that really assembled the team. So that was ultimately his grand scheme and I applied the tactics. So Dre was the one who picked all of us. And I look back at it, he was brilliant, bro. We was 21 at the time, 21 years old. And uh, he put together the all-star hustler team, the best thoughts, the best hustlers, the muscle, everything that we needed. The team had everything, 20 deep going up there. We, we opened up seven franchises all at the same time across the uh, Norfolk, Virginia area, the seven cities area, Suffolk, Virginia Beach, all that. So we opened up fr seven different franchises all the way around. So we get up there, uh, set up shop. Immediately we, Dre, you know, I say this, another thing. Dre was willing, he was smart, he understood. So when I say like, bro, we need to get out of the public and they, we got to be out here pound the country. He, he already had that mentality too. So we'll be like, I'd be like, bro, let's go to the mall. We all 20 deep, let's all get together, go to the mall 20 deep. So we go to the mall in downtown Norfolk and we walk around the mall 20 deep. We fly, you know what I'm saying, niggas, you know, we ain't got no money, but, cause we done put everything into this move, but we still, you know what I'm saying, flying all lit, right? So of course we standing out. So with that being said, um, um, you know, I'm talking about like the whole mall stopped and staring at us, bro, it was a crowd at night. And um, to the point where the security, it was like 10 security just started following us around the mile until we left. Not like they were harassing us. They ain't bother us or nothing at all, but they just wanted to make sure everything was straight. Yeah. So we created that much more pand pandemonium, you know what I'm saying, off the rip, like flash mobbing. So with that and Dre and us going to the hood, so Dre would go to the hood, I would go to the downtown and secure the, the business license and shit like that. I'm knowing, bro, we got to get DBAs, and shoes with cats that he know he needs to build with. So uh, I'm going left, he going right with it. We taking everything out. So we started really making a name, get, make a long story short. We like to the point where like we had thousands of customers, bro. And we had just got there within a month. So everybody knew who we was, the whole city, bro. So what happened was what went wrong. Something happened with the checks, bro. This is like a movie to where like, uh, we already knew to the city. They fucking with us because we came different, we Memphis niggas. So they want to give us a shot, right? Because this was popping, right? We knew. But at the same time, when the check started to land, they supposed to be out on the 5th. The 5th come, they ain't here. The 15th come, they ain't there. The 20th come, they ain't there. Niggas started getting impatient. You know what I'm saying? Naturally, respectfully. So niggas really started 
I remember our main location was Tidewater Drive. It had a glass front where you could see through the whole lower case of the building. We had a, a little apartment on, on the top stairs and we had the house across the street that was rented out. So they could see through the whole office at nighttime because it was a glass front. So uh, they used to ride through there all night, bro, because after the chase got delayed two times, they wanted to make sure we ain't run off and leave the city with their shit. We trying to tell them, bro, we ain't doing nothing wrong. We backed up because we got way more customers than we ever anticipated. So we really still processing and putting some in for stuff. And at the same time, some of the chicks that were supposed to drop, yeah, hadn't dropped. So it was a bunch of confusion with it, right? So keep in mind, you got, uh, what's the Q, uh, the, major fresh, the major tax franchises, uh, H&R Block, you know what I'm saying? Them, they telling customers, yeah, yeah, they fraud. They done called the news on us, got the news to come over there. So the news started coming. Um, but this time, this was actually right before the checks was delayed. So they came, everything was legit. They just came in on the random, bro. And um, they, everything was legit and cool, so they couldn't really say nothing. They tried to play it like, oh, we just want to do a story on the new business that's really trending in the city. They were really trying to come and catch us off guard and try to see we have our people. We were young and black. So uh, we had everything to get on the motherfuckers, so fuck y'all. So when they came in, we were straight. Uh, when we came, um, so everything was cool. The chicks started getting delayed. They hearing about that. The news hearing about it because folks started going to the news. So now they circle the block. The news start coming every day. So all them clippings on YouTube and stuff, like every day of them just pressing us. So they would come in there asking us about it. So we had this big final day. I'll never forget February the 5th, 2012, that the chicks were supposed to, it was supposed to be a big batch, enough to let folks know, bro, we straight, we, we getting y'all together. And that day came, and uh, no, that was February the 2nd. But that was right before, it was the Super Bowl 2012 was that Sunday. I'll never forget. That Friday, we were supposed to have the chicks in that morning. And, bro, literally, you, and it's all on, online, the news clippers or whatever. It was literally 100 and some people standing outside waiting on us, camped around the place, literally at 6 in the morning, waiting. So um, the, we, we pressed and walking around. Chicks ain't came, they ain't came, get 12 o'clock. So folks started getting tense. So about around about 4 o'clock, man, they, I ain't gonna lie, them folks took over the store on us. Like the, the customers came and bombarded the store on us. They had us healing up against the wall. I'm up against the wall like the earth. I ain't gonna lie, spook for my life. Me got pills, but we ain't got nothing. We, 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 we in soup mode right now. And we weren't thinking, you know what I'm saying? So we ain't got nothing in the desk or nothing. So we naked. So them niggas got us in there healed up against the wall, 20 deep, you know what I'm saying? They done came in there and snatched computers. The customers snatched the computers out of our store. Laptops, you know what I'm saying? They, they hot. So uh, somehow, I don't know what it was, but they finna get ready to get on my ass, bro. I ain't gonna even start to you. Something wasn't nothing but God. And I know God is this. Got a business situation where only he got me out of the square business. And uh, somehow, God distracted them for a second. Somehow, something happened in the, house, in the office, and they turned around, everybody, the whole crowd looked like in one of the movie scenes, and I swear to God, I got away, I ran. So I ran to the steps, right, going up to the apartment upstairs. They had a big uh, dough bolt, I mean, a big, big lock door, so I knew we'd get in there and we straight. So I'm coming up the stairs. My, home, my partner, G, uh, little G coming down the stairs. I'm like, G, I'm running. Get your hands upstairs, get the fuck out the way. So I'm going up the stairs. I'm like, bro, get the fuck out the way. So he turned around and running back. And uh, they were pulling, I remember nigga pulling my suit jacket and everything, bro. And I just wasn't nothing but the grace of God. We got the door and pushed the door closed and locked the door. So we locked in. They done took over the damn. We can't leave. And we stuck upstairs and it's all a little high. So ain't no, if you, we can jump, we'll survive, but you don't break something for sure. Yeah. So you just gonna have to make that decision. So uh, we stuck. So we called the police. And we like, uh, I swear I would never forget, we called 911, bro. And 911, it was a lady that answered the phone. And uh, she was, I was like, ma'am, I said, I want to report an emergency. Uh, you know, they took over our tax office and uh, we, we don't know what to do. You know, we'll do, we'll, can y'all send police over here? So she was like, uh, sure, what's the address? And I, I, it was like 15 something time water drive. And she was like, oh God, this is everything, bro. This is documented. Is this more money taxes? <laughs> and I'm like, what? You know what I'm saying? I said, yeah, why? Ah, hold on real quick. We'll send somebody over there, but it might be a while. So she, then long story short, so by that time there, they done took over the office. They got us stuck upstairs. We looking out the window. We opened the window up. We peeping out. 
They like, uh, yeah, jump nigga. Now first they ain't see us. But we kept looking, kept peeping out, trying to time how we gonna jump. Right when we get ready to jump, they saw us. Somebody came around the side and said, there they go right there. So everybody came around to their side. And uh, when they came around to their side, they were like, come on, jump, nigga. We're going to catch you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like, oh, man. So thank God we held off for about a good 20, 30 minutes. The police finally showed up hella deep. Police came. That was, I ain't going to lie. It was the first day in my life where I was so glad to see the police. Food. I was so happy to see those folks. My little folk came, cleared the office out, escorted us out of our office. We had the, uh, everybody knew we stayed in the house literally right across the street. You could see the house from the office, they literally right, like right over there. So we can't go to the house either. So um, make a long story short, all the, all the seven other locations hot. We can't go hide in there one of them. Now we did try to go hide in one. Um, and um, they found out we was there. We had to leave after about eight hours. They came, somebody came and saw us in there. So we left, that was Friday night. The police ended up having to escort us to the military base in Norfolk. So they escorted us onto the military base. So there are hotels on the military base. So they had us stay in the hotels and they even uh, made sure that one of the hotel rooms we had was free. So they covered, uh, the, the, see, I don't know who did, but they covered this. So they worked it out and then we had bought two more rooms. So we stayed there that weekend, 20 niggas, seven rooms, I mean three rooms, so it's seven niggas each room, sleeping on the floor, two, three niggas in the bed, everything, niggas trying to, trying to stay alive in the joint. So uh, the, the whole city looking for us the whole weekend. We ain't had no food, really, or nothing, and we didn't want to keep bad ones on base, because our money was tight. So we had to take the chance and go to Walmart. Man, I mean, I'll never forget, we went to Walmart about five of us. We was straight, we was at Walmart. After about 10, 15 minutes, somebody spotted us. They got no more money, niggas, right there. So all of a sudden, everybody in the Walmart, I mean, I'm not, this is not cap, bro, at all. This is all documented. Those folks basically chased us up out of Walmart, basically, because everybody was basically going to get on our ass. So we leave Walmart. Well, luckily, we already got, got our stuff out of here. So we leave Walmart, come back. We knew we could not leave the military base at all until we leave this city. So we basically, we barred out the whole seven cities to go. So, um... We get uh, Sunday, Super Bowl, Monday come, the checks, we supposed to drop. The, the news been in touch with us all weekend, all the different local media, it's like, when y'all gonna drop the checks? So we gotta stay in touch with them, because if we don't stay in touch with them, they gonna go back, oh, y'all, they fraud, they ain't answering our calls, we, we know how they do, they ain't answering. Yeah. So we had to stay and get them all the business. We gonna drop the checks at 2 o'clock that day. Make a long story short, um, 2 o'clock came, like the whole city, so all the, like down there, half of the police in Norfolk had to come to the military base and escort us to one of the, to the tax office that we was going to do the checks in. Um, they, we get there, one of the checks didn't work, everybody got scared, all this on the news at this point. I can tell the rest of the story on that. But uh, make a long story short, man, uh, we ended up getting a few checks out that day, you know what I'm saying, we got a few hundred checks out that day. And uh, that night, man, uh, the police force had to escort us out the city, man. So they escorted us outside of uh, the whole Norfolk or the whole county area to the interstate and let us get on the interstate. We shot back to Memphis. By the time we get back to Memphis, we was there for a few days. Like I said, they congressmen on our ass, feds, everybody. Oh, I forget when, I, when they left, when we left that tax office that night, the feds took us to the interrogation building, the federal interrogation building down there. They interrogated us for a few hours. You know, everybody kept the solid, you know what I'm saying, same story. So they let us roll. So uh, we get back to Memphis. We stayed in Memphis about two weeks, and the feds came in town. Feds and the IRS. So they come together. Man, they knocked on folks' doors, did like my foster family. Folks, I ain't think they got no business knowing. When I saw this, I said, yeah, we got to go. I got to get out of town. Because they were grabbing niggas and taking them back up to Virginia and shit, or taking them to North Carolina to another fed building out there or some shit. So we get there, um, I, get, I get out of town, I go shoot to Houston, and then the rest, that's how, you know, the Houston story came about. Yeah. So that's the whole, that whole one one in Texas era right there. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, man, that shit, that shit was crazy. I said I'm gonna make a comedy movie loosely based off this shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what else you working on right now? Shit, more music. Um, man, I also, I, I, man, I write sports articles. I ain't even seen nothing about that. So I help cover with the Memphis Grizzlies. So I do that, uh, you know what I'm saying? I just add like a hip hop perspective, rap perspective or whatever. 
So uh, I just been with that. So I work with them on that so from time to time. As far as one of the main, uh, the main, the local uh, media coverage in that area that covers them, I work with them doing that. So uh, I do that. Shit, of course the music, man. Like I said, Harry Bush's Good Men is coming soon. Uh, also, Mind for Yours Part Two is coming soon. And then, uh, of course, everything else is online, man. I'm thinking about spinning off on Circle, Circle B Smoke Sausage and Jungle Juice. So we might spin it off and do something else with it. Uh, but yeah, man, I got about five projects gonna drop this year. I know Harry Bush and Good Mead is the one that's locked in, we really locked in on right now. But the other four, I really haven't put titles on yet, to be honest with you. So that's what we're working on currently at the moment on the music front. And then as far as uh, multimedia content going, man, just continuing to build a market. Because I'm a, I, I market and consult with, you know what I'm saying, different companies and shit to now to this day. So uh, that's how, that's one of the ways I make my living. So, um, with, you know, that's really the bulk of it. So with that being said, uh, I'm, I got a lot of stuff going as far as working with different companies and connecting some dots as far as the, the brand, square business, and, and connecting those dots with that. So that's what we got going that's real. That's like, kind of broad, but you know what I mean? I just like to keep it like that till there's more detail coming to play with it. That's real though. Yep, yep. Any last words and shout outs? Yeah, yeah, man. Shout out to, you know what I'm saying? Get my jewelry right. Ice water, Beezy. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I gotta holler at my boy. Shout out my cousin, Wingo. Shout out the whole Kinfo, uh, Kinfo clique. You know what I'm saying? Shout out my brother, S-O-Y-L Boom. Shout out E20, my other brother. 20 was on here the first time I came over together. Uh, shout out, man. Man, a lot of everybody in the city, in town, y'all know what it is, man. Um, and, and, you know, shit. Out there, I'm trying to think of something else, man. That's pretty much it, man. Ed Memphis Square Business, y'all know what it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me, bro. The most importantly, person of ever, of course, you know what I'm saying, my queen, my wife, shout out to Daisha, beauty is pain, at beauty is, I-Z underscore pain, beauty is pain is the brand, man, that's like, I wouldn't be nothing I am today without that woman, that queen, that God bless me, man, so uh, shout out to her, of course, uh, shout out to Diamond Bahamut, I know she wanted to say her name or something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm Diamond, <laughs> uh, my Instagram is at underscore Diamond with three Ds at the end. And I'm a cosmetologist as well. I have a hair page. It's um, the Dime Experience underscore. You did. Y'all check me out. You did. Square business. And uh, shit, that's, that's pretty much. Oh, yeah. At man on the square is the social media handle on, on, on IG. Uh, just stream Ed Memphis, man. You already know what it is. Stream Ed Memphis. Them my last word. Stream Ed Memphis, man. Run them streams on stream DGB, especially this interview. Uh -huh. yeah, square business. Straight like that. Ed yeah, Memphis, yeah. we appreciate having you on the porch today, man. You today, already gang. know it, man. I appreciate y'all having me, bro. That's square business. Square business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Swamp mother, gorilla, double digit winner, never been a chicken dealer. Swamp